Hi guys, welcome back to the Casual Watch Review channel. So I've been reviewing some great Amiga watches recently, in part thanks to the generosity of the guys over at Bob's Watches, who've got a great selection of pre-owned Amiga watches they're letting me get my hands on. I've reviewed the, that very quirky Michael Phelps. I did a comparison between the Daytona and the Speedmaster, and then I reviewed those two incredible, that dark side and the gray side of the moon. That gray side of the moon with that meteorite dial, I think is probably one of the best watches that I've ever seen in person. It's just awesome that dial well this week we're reviewing an amiga that i am not a huge fan of and i'm probably going to catch some flack in the comment section because this is a very well liked amiga watch for me i'll go through some of the reasons as we're doing the review this is a great pre-owned example yep the watch that was made very famous by the james bond spectre film this isn't that limited edition version this is the the liquid metal version we'll go over the review We'll have a look at it really up close. It is a good looking watch, but for me, the design is, it's n I've never been a fan of it. But again, doesn't matter what I think, it matters what you guys think. So let's flip the camera around and dive into the review. Let's kick this off with a quick history lesson. In 1957, Omega introduced the original Seamaster 300 a watch that they designed specifically for divers and professionals who worked underwater. More than half a century later, this Seamaster 300 was reintroduced, and this is the one we're going to take a closer look at. When I think of this watch, I can't help but think of one of the most iconic watch scenes in a James Bond film. Second only, I'd say, to the laser that Pierce Brosnan uses in GoldenEye. A version of this Seamaster that was specifically made for Spectre makes for one of the most memorable scenes, arguably in one of the least well-received Daniel Craig Bond films. When Bond is being tortured by Blofeld, he passes his watch to Madeleine, played by Leia Sedu. Already primed with an alarm that he was advised earlier in the film by Q had a very loud alarm. Does it do anything? It tells the time. Oh, one word of warning. The alarm is rather loud, if you know what I mean. I think I do. Then this watch is key to the birth of the legend of how Blofeld got his trademark scarred eye. The 300 we have here does differ from the Spectre watch that later Omega released as a limited edition, but it's easily confused to the untrained eye. The Spectre watch had no 12 o'clock markings a different lollipop style second hand and most obviously it had a 12 hour bezel as opposed to this watch that has the more traditional dive bezel. Now Omega have created a homage to that original 1957 Seamaster and they included that in their 1957 trilogy. This had more faithful dimensions to the original 39mm as opposed to this 300 that has 41mm case. Of course, this 1957 homage was limited to 3,557 pieces. Unfortunately, the only thing not limited edition at Omega these days for their desirable watches is the number of limited edition models they are producing. To go with the new Seamaster 300 that we have here today, that 1957 had an awkward lug measurement of 19 millimeters, and this 300 we're looking at today has an equally awkward lug width of 21 millimeters. I'm not quite sure why they've done that. We also saw this 21 millimeter lug width on the dark and the gray side of the moon. This Seamaster 300 features a unidirectional rotating bezel, although it misses some of the iconic elements of that original 1957 watch where the loom pip was on the inner track. The 41mm brushed and polished stainless steel case is presented on a matching bracelet. This bracelet features a high polishing on the center links and a clasp that features a diver's extension. It also has a transparent case back making it possible to see the anti-magnetic Omega Master Coaxial Caliber 8400. I really like this touch. The back doesn't have that same level of doming that we saw on the dark side of the moon watches it features a more traditional exhibition case back the movement is stunning to look at through this case back it features a wave design on the rotor and viewable behind the silicon balance spring we can see that very delicate pelage that's applied 
The case itself features brushed and polished elements and a ceramic and liquid metal bezel. This is a triumph of technology using a zirconian based liquid metal to fill the ceramic insert. It really shows the level of effort that Omega have gone to here. These two elements are fused together, the ceramic and the liquid metal. This is unlike a Rolex or other bezels that have white gold painted in there or other materials painting in while we've got the watch out let's do a quick wrist shot this is on my 7.2 inch wrist even though the case is larger it is still a comfortable watch because it has that domed exhibition case back the bracelet on here is very well executed with those screw in links let's take a closer look at the specs here and then i will tell you why i love this model the least out of the omega lineup so looking at the measurements to start with, we have a 21 millimeter lug width, as previously mentioned, very awkward. The case is steel. The case diameter is 41 millimeters. The dial color is black and they've done an awesome job of this sandblasted black dial here. It features a scratch resistant sapphire crystal with an anti-reflective treatment on the inside. Of course, it's water resistant to 300 meters to go along with its name. The movement is anti-magnetic and Omega really do a fantastic job of their anti-magnetic movements. This one is anti-magnetic up to 1.5 Tesla or 15,000 Gauss. As you'd expect, it features a screwing crown. The movement in this watch is the Omega 8400. This is a no-date version of their 8500 movement. Features 39 jewels, it's a self-winding coaxial escapement and two barrels mounted in series. This is what gives it that very impressive 60 hour power reserve so you could easily put it on your nightstand on a Friday night and it would still be running on Monday when you were ready for work. So after all of these great things that I've mentioned, what are the reasons why I personally don't like this watch? And again, these are totally personal preference here. For a start, I think they could have done a better job of making it look more like the vintage model and having a more refined dive watch. I think this would have made an excellent accompaniment to the Aquaterra line, a personal favourite of mine. In fact, if I was to pull the trigger on another Omega, it would be a pre-owned X33 or the original 15,000 Gauss with that stunning yellow and black second hand. I think one of the most iconic Aquaterra watches they've ever made. The bezel that made the original 1957 so unique is also not as obvious in this version. The almost double bezel look, although the coin edge bezel on this newer version is very well executed. I don't love the application of peach loom here. I've mentioned this several times before. I think this peach effect loom seems to be done to death by Omega at the moment. Maybe a nice application of green or white loom would have looked perfect on this watch. Another thing is that the watch is very chunky and I think that's down to the 14.5 millimeter depth to the case, which obviously would be increased if you had it on a NATO. It lacks an element of refinement but this could be an optical illusion I'm seeing. I don't feel like the military look of the dial suits the case. The proportions of the printing on the dial just seem to be off in my eye. The dial itself is beautifully executed in that sandblasted black finish, however. And my last point here, it isn't specifically to do with this steel version, but Omega have made the bizarre, in my opinion, choice to make this in precious metals. With the military style dial and proportions, the gold one resembles something more akin to an Invicta. Now, the Speedmaster in gold looks awesome, but this version I don't think suits a precious metal alternative and don't even get me started on the pricing of those models. Anyway guys, that was my review. As always, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what you guys think. So let me know in the comments section down below. If this is your first upload of mine that you're watching, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. We also have a podcast out now as well, link in the description down below. As always, I really do appreciate you watching and I'll see you next time on the Casual Watch Review channel. Thanks guys, bye.